Welcome to Real Steve TV. I'm Steve, and uh, I'll be your host. And uh, I want to dedicate um, at least one stream a week to like Bible study and talking about the Lord and uh, talking about God. Because um, as some of you know, you know, I started this whole thing out by being open with my faith about being a gamer, a streamer, a YouTuber, and a Christian. And um, I think it's really important for me for what I feel like God is calling me to do, which is just, you know, use this space, use this platform as a place to, you know, talk about the Lord and, and talk about God and stuff. Um, I think it's just maybe needed or this is a good place to connect with people that might not necessarily think about God or, or Christianity and Twitch or gaming and Christianity and the same thing. But um, I believe there's like a lot of men and younger men or all kinds of men that love games um, and are searching for something or are Christian or are interested about Christianity. Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you for this time um, tonight, and uh, thank you for thank you for our lives, Lord, and thank you for everything we have, and and thank you for our shelter, thank you for our clothing, thank you for our food, Lord. Um, it's easy to like forget about being grateful, Father, but you know, on top of that, you also died for our sins and gave us your Son as a sacrifice, Lord. So, um. I thank you for that. And I just want to uh, encourage and lift up any viewers that may uh, come into the stream or see this on a YouTube video. I just want to encourage them wherever they're at in their life, Lord. And I pray that you would you would uh, enter their lives, Father, and open their eyes and their ears to the truth. And um, that you would comfort them and guide them. I pray that you would put, put a curiosity in their heart and their mind and their soul. Um, that there's something more to this life, God, than just what we sometimes think it is, Father. And and that something more is you. Um, it's you, Lord. It's you, Jesus. And I just pray that um, you would use this in any way to help help anybody who comes across this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So right here, we are in the Gospel of John, the book of John. We're in chapter 1. And I'm just going to kind of just go through it a little bit verse by verse or or a few verses at a time hey bald man good evening my man how's it going yes sir i can do you a favor can you pray that i use my new affiliate status to glorify his name amen let's pray for that right now um jonathan father i just want to lift up um jonathan and I know we don't know each other well, but I consider him a friend, Father, and I consider him a brother in Christ, Lord. And um, I just pray for Jonathan, Lord, that you would come into his life and inspire him and motivate him and encourage him, Lord, to glorify your name through his channel. Um, I know we can both relate to this. We're both gamers. We love games. We're about the same age, Father. And it's no secret that this whole space can be very toxic and very negative and it can be intimidating to uh to be open about you lord and i know it's a pressure from the world the secular world society what people may think of us etc all the stuff that i know that all my fellow christian friends go through father but you've done so much for us Lord, that it's just a small thing really to to be open and encourage people and use our little platforms, Lord, to glorify your name, Father. And that's really what it's about at the end of the day. And along the way, we can have fun and play games and, and do what we love and what we're passionate about. But at the end of the day, Lord, the most important thing is you. The most important thing is seeking you. The most important thing is telling other people about you. Um, hanging out with fellow believers and studying the Bible and, and praying for each other. And, um, and any people that may not be believers, but they're curious or they get interested 
through our streams, God, we never know who we could reach and touch through this, Lord. So I just pray that, again, you would encourage Jonathan and, and inspire him and motivate him and give him fresh new ideas, what he could do with his stream to glorify your name, Lord. And thank you so much for that. Um, and thank you so much for Jonathan and, and his help that he's given me. And uh, I just pray that we would, you know, use each other, like the Bible says, like iron sharpens iron and, and help each other in any way that we can, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Awesome, dude. That's awesome. That's the first pair request on Real Steve TV. Um, but yeah, I think I, I was talking to you about this, and I think I'm going to just like do this once a week for approximately an hour and take just one day. It's a, it's also a good day for me to step away from the games and the gaming or just to reset kind of, you know, cause I've been going at it hard. Um, and I'm feeling the effects of burnout, you know? And so I'm like, well, Lord, it's not just about the gaming, you know, for me, I'm like, I really want to, I mean, how cool would it be if like a Twitch Bible study grew, you know, and people came together on here and, and talked about the Lord, you know, and that's just kind of where I'm at. And I'm just, you know, I'm still new to this and, and getting used to it. I'm just throwing spaghetti at the wall and seeing what quote unquote sticks. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'm going to be reading from um, John, uh, the gospel of John. I'm in John one verse 14. Um, so I don't know if you want to stick around longer or if you have to go or whatnot, but I'm just going to keep doing it. And, uh, if you want to talk obviously, or have insight or questions or anything, you can throw them at me and we can discuss it here. Um, but we're at, uh, again, John one, John one verse 14. So I'm going to just read a few verses and go from there. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Okay, cool. So, um, so like last week, we, we read up to verse 14, and obviously this gospel immediately starts out with like the identity of Christ and like who He is. And I love the book of John because if anyone ever asks me like some someone who doesn't believe and they're like what what where does the bible say that jesus is god and god is jesus um i would always encourage them to read the whole book of john because there's just a lot of stuff in the book of john that shows that jesus is god you know and uh let's go back to verse 14 and the word became flesh so we have to flash back really quick to verse one so going back in verse one it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And then we jump to verse 14 and it says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glory of light and the glory as of only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And, um, you know, Jesus is the only man to be like born of a virgin birth. Yes. Archmagus is in the house. Um, so, so sometimes like you'll get this thing with people in the world saying like, well, we're all children of God. And I talked about this last week. And yes, that's true. We are all children of God in the sense that every life that comes into existence comes from God. Right. But Jesus is different, not only because he didn't sin, but like in this verse, the only begotten of the father, he's the only human who's come into existence through a virgin birth, like physically, biologically, but directly from God, you know, conceived directly by God in, in Mary. And so that separates him there too, you know, obviously for obvious reasons. Um, and then it says in verse 15, John bore witness of him and cried out saying, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me is preferred before me for he was before me. So this is interesting. Um, 
John is actually older than Jesus. And I think it's approximately like six months older. So in another gospel, I forget which one, or it might be in some other gospels, but they actually talk about how John's mother gets pregnant. And then soon after, or within about six months, I believe off the top of my head, I should probably Google it. Um, but then about approximately six months after that, um, John, uh, or Jesus is conceived. All right. And it says that when Mary and then John's mom, they're both pregnant and they, they talk to each other in person, they meet up physically. And it says in the scriptures that their wombs both jumped. And dude, I just think that's such a cool, beautiful picture to picture these two women, Mary, you know, assume I'm assuming she's a little freaked out. <laughs> you know, and uh, going to this person and, and both of their wombs jumping because in the spiritual realm, not only is this physical, two babies in a womb physically, but this is also something spiritual happening, right? And it's like that's already being communicated while these, while they're, while John and Jesus are in the womb. And I think it's such a cool, beautiful picture. Imagine like, the joy, the excitement, the fear that they must have been experiencing, like being like, wow, like, you know, Mary's like, I'm, I'm, I'm a, vir I conceived of, of a, as a virgin, you know, I'm giving birth to the savior of the world. That's crazy, you know, and what a wild experience for her. But the fact that it says, this was he of whom I said he was coming after me is preferred is preferred before me for he was before me. So if, if Jesus is younger, how could he come before John, right? <clears throat> John in the order of things is born first. So John's first, and then Jesus comes after as far as their physical birth ages. But this is evidence that he's talking about something deeper and spiritual evidence that Jesus is God because he was before him. Like it says in the beginning, you know, the word was with God in the beginning and Jesus is that word. And it goes back to what Jesus says about himself. I am the way, the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the father except through me. And, um, you have to ask yourself, you know, and you, as you study the Bible and, and research it and look into it, either Jesus was just one of many insane people that have come along in the world that claim to be Jesus, you know, Jesus would just be another like essentially a new cult leader or something right which i know some people believe that essentially um so either you either jesus is telling the truth and he is the way in the the truth and the life you know or jesus is just another like common lunatic who thinks he's jesus this is nothing new like there's been men throughout history who claim to be jesus right um the most modern day example is like Kanye West as of late has been going around saying stuff like I'm the new Jesus, you know, and I just, I find it bizarre, you know, I just find it so bizarre that men, us men, sinners in the world always drag Jesus into it. You know what I mean? Like, first of all, what Jesus is, is a perfect man. So to have, even have the arrogance of being like, I'm Jesus, I'm the new Jesus, right? Kanye's like the most recent example I can think of, but I've seen several documentaries in the last five to 10 years, um, where men claim to be Jesus. I've seen two of them. One guy's like a foreigner. I can't remember where, like in Eastern Europe or like in Russia or something. And he's like, has this huge cult following and he dresses in a white robe and his hair's long and he has a beard and looks like Jesus, you know, and claims he's Jesus. And then there was another guy in America who like started a cult and he claimed he was like Jesus in a different body now, like reincarnated in this body. And his wife was like Mary Magdalene or some, something like that, you know, dude. And it just, it blows my mind, you know? And one reason I believe in the Lord, there's a lot of reasons I believe in the Lord, but one of the reasons I do believe in God is because if this man was fake and this was all a lie, how is it that 2,000 years later, the name of Jesus causes so much controversy, so much conflict? You know what I mean? If he was just another crazy man 
why wouldn't have this like died and gone away a long time ago is like my question. You know, it, it seems to me that if, if Jesus was just another crazy fool who thought he was God and he wasn't like, he would have been long forgotten about by now, you know? Um, so I just find that interesting. <clears throat> so let's jump to six verse 16. Um, so again, we're in, uh, John one sixteen. And of his fullness, we have all received and grace for grace for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Um, and of his fullness, we have all received and grace for grace for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, remember, um, you know, I don't know if you know this, but like, <clears throat> it's, it's funny, like the law the law essentially shows and proves that us men on earth are sinners like going to the old testament law but even even modern day law you know we need rules set up rules and consequences the law that has to be set up so that when men break them justice is served right and this goes for both ancient laws and new laws right um if none of us were sinners or ever broke the law, there would never, there would never really need to be a law. So imagine a world where no one ever stole or stole. Would, would we even have the mindset to be like, we need to come up with a law for people who steal. It would be foreign to us. We'd be like, what do you mean? No, nobody ever steals. But like the sin in us, all us men, like all us men, women, we know there is sin in the world. And, I ask you, viewer, have you ever stole anything in your life? And we're just talking about one law, right? In in the Old Testament, it's one of the Ten Commandments, thou shall not steal. And in modern day society, it's um it's a law, and if you steal, you can get in trouble. But uh, how many of you have ever stolen something? All right, and I'll I'll be I'll play the game, but I've stolen something before in my life. Um, so I'm guilty on that one and I won't, we won't, we don't have to get into the other nine. All right. We don't have to embarrass ourselves here. Um, but like, honestly, I, I pretty much have committed all, all the sins on, on the 10 commandments with exception for thou shall not murder. You know, that's one thing I've managed to not do. Thank God. Um, not that I'm like a violent guy or anything like that, or really struggled with violence. You know, I've never been a fighter kind of guy or in a position where you might kill someone, I guess. I, I think of being like, if you were in a gang or if you like grew up in a environment where like carrying guns at a young age is common, like, you know, sometimes I th see these young people, um, that ruin their lives and they're like 14, 15, 16, cause they have already killed and murdered, you know, and it's so sad, but, uh, back to the law, the law essentially shows us men that we're sinners and that we're not perfect and that we do sin. And hence why Jesus has to come into the world because he's the first man that comes into the world and lives the life that God intended for all of us to live. Remember, God hates sin, and he doesn't want any of us to sin. He doesn't want us to steal. He doesn't want us to lie. He doesn't want us to murder, you know, and um, and we do. And I mean this collectively, but I also mean it individually. I'm sure there's at least one of the Ten Commandments you've broken, if not more. Um, and as a whole, you know, mankind commits all sorts of sins, and so Jesus comes to be the first person to fulfill that. So that, that kind of is getting at what it says in verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So we were talking about this in my men's Bible study, that combination of grace and truth. Jesus came to save us from all this by living the life that he lived and then us accepting that life and, and believing in him and believing on his name, you know, then we, we have the right, I don't even want to say right, we have the gift of eternal life <clears throat> because we put our faith in him. And we say, you know what, Lord, I believe, you know, I believe in you. I believe what you did 
Um, and you are the only man that was able to conquer sin and death. Um, so that's like the grace. He came to save us and he forgives us of our sins. He forgives us for all of our sins, all the sins we've committed before, the sins we're struggling with now today that we might've committed today and the future and, and, and sins we're going to commit in the future, you know? Um, but it, the grace is also in, in conjunction with the truth, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Um, you know, he's true in the sense that again, he's perfect. He lived a true life. He never think about it. He never betrayed anybody. He never backstabbed anybody. He never broke any of the Ten Commandments. He never stole. He never uh, slept with a woman outside of marriage. He never lied. You know, and so it's like, it's his grace and forgiveness and the potency of like, he's the truth. You know, and those two things like, in his case, go together, grace and truth, which I think is beautiful. In verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. All right. So like Jesus coming into the world shows like finally kind of not. Yeah, well, it shows that God is, is a person. He's a personal God. He comes in the form of a man to show us like it's almost like God's like, well, if I was a man, this is how it should be done. You know, and he was a man. And it's like the ultimate example. He's like what I like to call the prototype. So, you know, like if they're building like um, a, a, whatever, a new invention, there's the prototype and it's like the original one. And it's, it's like perfect as it can be or close to as perfect as it can be. And then all the other makes and models the, of the same thing come after it. But that original one is like the prototype. Well, Jesus is like the prototype for humanity. You know, he's like, um, he's the model. He's the perfect model that we're to follow. And he's the perfect model that, you know, God wishes for all of us. God wishes we all had that relationship with him. And we don't, and none of us ever will, because we're not perfect and we are sinners and God still loves us. And once you accept Christ, you are now on a journey for the rest of your life, you know, until the day you die of seeking after him and making progress and fighting and, and, and fighting through your sin and repenting of your sin and, and trying over and over again. You know, there's, I've, I've lived a long, dark life, you know, guys, and I've made a lot of sins, you know, and I've, I've been open about this, but again, in a nutshell, my, my worst sins were addiction to marijuana, addiction to alcohol and jumping from relationship to relationship with women outside of marriage and having sex before marriage. And those like three things, booze, weed, women, like controlled my life, my mind, the way I operated, the way I think, um, the choices I would make, you know what I mean? Like, and it was a dark life. And, you know, a lot of people from the outside looking in, you know, and this was all through my 20s and into my like early 30s. Well, this was actually from a teenager um, up until like my early 30s. And then I got sober for five years. And then right around COVID, I relapsed for a year and a half. And then here I am again. I'm almost about to be three years sober. Um, and we all have different paths that we take. And I'm, I'm here to encourage people who may be stuck in a certain sin. And remember, sin can be external and sin can be internal too. Because um, Jesus said, like, I even if you look at a woman lustfully, like in your heart, you've committed adultery with her and you have to think all sins have to start on the inside before they become external. So either way, sin is sin, whether you act on it and it's outside or it's something deep in your heart, you know, that you have lust or hatred or anger, but I'm just here to encourage anyone who may be watching or see this, that this thing called Christianity and Jesus and following the God, it's a process. And I believe that 
some people for some things sometimes get delivered like immediately and they are miraculous miraculous things but sometimes i think that christianity like popular christianity oversells that idea and it's kind of like um portrayed as like oh if you give your life to jesus everything in your life's like going to get instantly better and you're going to have like victory over all the sins that you've struggled with and you're going to get a better job and you're going to start get, making more money and your life's going to be like perfect and sometimes i think christianity has been sold like that it, it sold in, in america that way with popular christianity pastors that get famous tv shows that are christian you know it's called the prosperity gospel and don't get me wrong i believe god can deliver someone you know, overnight from something or some things in their life dramatically change. But I also have seen and know from firsthand experience, some of the things we're struggling with are going to take time because of all those years that you've struggled with, whatever it is, you know, let's say you've struggled with it for five years, 10 years, 15 years, since you were a kid, sometimes those things don't just you don't just snap your fingers and those things come to an end sometimes you have to keep fighting and struggling and struggling you know in psalms it says the righteous man falls down seven times and gets up and um the wicked man falls down is and is consumed by chaos so really guys especially as like men and women too it doesn't matter but as men who are called to be leaders of our families and our homes and our relationships, it's like we have to set the example and we have to keep fighting through our mistakes, our sins, our failures and repenting and going to God and saying, father, I'm sorry. I did it again. Forgive me. Give me the strength to quit, whatever. Um, and keep doing that, you know, day, day in and day out, day in and day out. And it's going to, as time goes on, it'll change us. It'll erode, it'll erode away. And there will be the day we finally have victory over that thing or sin or whatever that's troubling us. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to like talk about that because sometimes it gets me down the things I've struggled with in the past and the things that I'm still working on in the present. And I get down on myself and I think, like, how can I be a Christian, Lord? Like, I'm still struggling with this thing, or I, I keep going back to this sin, or or whatever. And I'm like, I'm not like, you know, I'm not like perfect like you, Jesus, and holy. And it's like, well, I never will be, you know? And because of that doesn't mean I'm going to give up on God, you know, and stop following God because I'm a sinner. You know, it's kind of funny, but when I used to be a high school teacher and this was funny, this would happen all the time, but like I would have my rules of my class, you know, and if someone was breaking the rule, I would like have to confront them, you know, and I was, eh, well, it depended on the day, but if I'm in a being patient and kind and all that, it's like, Hey, that's a warning. No big deal. You know, like the first time any student did an infracture, it's like, it's all good. It's just like, we're learning, you're learning, you know, but it'd be so funny that they're breaking a rule and then I point it out and then it makes them more mad and they're even more mad at me. And I'm like, how funny you're breaking my class rules. I point it out and now I'm the jerk. And that's just a perfect metaphor for us at times. And sometimes for what I, what I see in non-believers, it's like, it's like they're sinning. And on top of it all, they're mad at God too. You know, just like the student in this example, it's like they're breaking the rules and they're mad at me, you know, and I, I see the misery that that causes. It's caused me misery. I've been in that place in my life, you know, Archimedes, that makes a lot of sense, right? And it's, it's, I, I just attribute it to the darkness of our sin. Instead of us saying, like, like the student, instead of him saying, oh, my bad, sir, you know, and I'll try again. That's much better than, hey, you shouldn't do that. F you. And then it, he escalates it and it's worse now. And you're like, whoa, you just were in trouble for one thing. And now you're <laughs> breaking more rules because you're mad because I caught you doing something bad, you know? And, and I think that's like the power of sin. Hence why we need a savior. We needed Jesus to come in and, and save us from sin and death and the darkness 
because that darkness is so deep and pro- profound and pro- and perverse that it's like human nature. You know, it's human nature for the little kid. Like to, you, you catch a little kid stealing or lying and they'll innately cover it up with the, another sin. And it's, you don't have to teach a kid to lie. Like, think about it. You don't have to take a kid aside and tell them, hey, you know how me and your mom said, like, don't get candy before dinner? Well, if you ever want to, like, pull one over on us, you know, you could actually take the candy and then hide it. And then when we ask you, you could tell us, like, no, you didn't. And then we wouldn't know. Imagine that, right? That That's so counterintuitive. Like, we would never have to explain to a child how to lie. You have to explain to a child that you have to tell the truth. So even that dichotomy, or and it's not a dichotomy, but even that, that, that fact of life right there makes me believe in God in an ultimate right, in an ultimate wrong, and that we're inclined to be that way, you know? Um, let's see. So, um, I'm not totally sure on verse 18, so I don't want to act like I do know because this one confused me a little bit, but I'm going to read the footnote in my Bible. So verse 18 says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is the bosom of the father, he has declared him. The only thing I can say off my head, and this is just me theorizing. I don't know the answer to this for sure. For sure. I'm going to read the footnote to see what it says, but Jesus is the only one who was in relationship with God in that way, in that deep, deep way that he's the only one who's like truly seen God. I mean, he is God. He came from God or they're both one or God sent him, you know? And so he has a very special relationship with God. Unlike any other person in the Bible, any other modern day Christian who's like, I don't know, like, known for being a Christian, none of us will ever have the relationship that he had with him and like truly saw him. Um, but the footnote says in the Greek new Testament, this verse begins with the word God theon without the definite article. It therefore refers to God as spirit. John is declaring that no created being has ever seen God in his essence as spirit. This first statement is to be connected with verse one, which also speaks of Jesus Christ in his self-existence as an eternal and infinite spirit. Then to show the very special relationship of the son to the father, he is called monogenes. Sorry, I'm butchering this. It's like a Greek word. He is called monogenes. The word is translated only begotten, thus giving the false idea that in his eternal state, he was generated by the father. The second part of verse 18 declares that this unique son or unique God, as some manuscripts have it, who has always been in the bosom of the father manifested the Godhead and made him understood. This second declaration of verse 18 agrees with verse 14, which speaks of the incarnation of the logos, the word. So that one, I don't want to like expound upon really, cause I don't know what I'd be talking about. Um, except for what I've already said. All right, so let's jump to verse 19. Um, now, this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you? that we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandals strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. So this is important because, you know, again, in Jewish tradition and law and in their scriptures or in the Old Testament, this, this prophecy has been spoken of a long time ago. And so in verse uh, 
22 john's actually or verse 23 john's actually quoting the old testament that that let's see this part that says the voice of one crying in the wilderness make straight the way of the lord um that's from the old testament right so he's quoting from that and he's like i'm fulfilling the part of like i'm preparing the way for jesus he's like already getting the people prepared to meet jesus and then hence he's baptizing with water but he says um i baptize with water but there stands one among you whom you do not know it is he who coming after me is preferred before me whose sandal strap i am not worthy to loose these things were done in beth beth Ah, Bethabara beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing and Jesus himself said you know John came baptizing in water and I come baptizing in fire or the Holy Spirit so um yes I believe you have to be I believe you have to be okay I believe it's good to get a physical baptism and to get like dunked in water at your church in front of people I think that's a good thing it's a symbolic thing it actually symbolizes like being buried in the ground and then like r rising out of the water is like rising actually out of the earth and you're refreshed and you're renewed in eternal life. So I think it's a good symbolic thing to do because it means it's like salvation for you and a declaration of like, I believe in Jesus, you know, and I'm changed and I'll be changed from here on out. Um, <clears throat> but, but, more importantly is this baptism by jesus he talks about baptizing with fire and baptizing with the holy spirit it's the internal thing right so an x again just like i was talking about sin starts internally and then it comes out externally well that's the same for a true believer in christ um you in your heart know if you believe in jesus ultimately you know and I know we have friends and family and we meet other people and other Christians and we might have had Christian friends or Christian family. And we can like assume like, yeah, I, I know they're a believer. They love the Lord. They go to church, all that. But I mean, I, at the end of the day, we, we don't know our only, you know, your heart fully, you know, and like obvious, like the obvious example is some of these Christians, pastors on TV, the prosperity gospel guys, you know, as you study the Bible and read it and, and learn it dude some of these christians on tv i'm like how can you like claim that you're a christian you know and the the way you preach and the things you focus on again the prosperity gospel there's nothing wrong with god blessing you and making money there's nothing wrong with you wanting to do better for yourself and get a better job or get a promotion or do a side hustle like all that there's nothing wrong with that but it's not the most important thing. Remember, our example is Jesus, who came and essentially was a man of very little means. He was born into poverty, right? He was a carpenter as his trade or profession. And then he essentially starts his own ministry with his disciples traveling around that region, you know, going from town to town, city to city. Like he, he, was, he didn't own stuff in this earth or this world. And, um, I'm not saying like to necessarily sell all your stuff and just start traveling the world or anything like that, though. I, I believe some people probably are called to do that, you know, and that is their life's purpose and mission is to like be a missionary and, and just travel the world and tell people about Jesus. If that's what God's calling you to do, that's awesome. Um, But back to what I'm saying is like the most important thing isn't getting a raise or or having a better house or getting a better car or putting your own family before God. The most important thing is God. And like Jesus said, if you, you know, if you focus on the kingdom of God first, all these things will be added onto you. The money, the house, the car, the food, the clothes, that's all bonus stuff. It's all supplementary. And I, I just believe popular culture, the secular world, our country, we have it completely flipped you know, my Bible study leader last night was saying that, like, I, I this this stat was hard to believe, but I'm just going to go with it. But he said, like, there was a poll taken and 87% of Americans said they believe in God. I find that hard to believe. Now, when you dive into that 87%, then even less believe that 
that God is the God of the Bible or Jesus, right? So, but what I'm getting at is our culture is almost flipped. It's almost like, no, money and a better job and things and a better house and your career, that's all first. And then Jesus is secondary and he comes in and, and pads it and supplements it. He's the backdrop to my life. You know what I mean? Like work's the most important thing to me. And then I go to Jesus when I need some help. Oh, my family, my wife, my kids, my house is the most important thing to me. And then when I need a fallback guy, I fall back to Jesus. Like he's the backup. And that's, we, and I've had that wrong for years and years. And I struggled with that from day to day. I find myself going back into my like self-resilience, self-reliance, caring about how much money I make, caring about my stature in the world or my title or what I am. You know what I mean? And I have to stop myself and think like, that's all great. And God's not saying not to try and do your best, but that's secondary. Do you know what I mean? My first important thing is working on my relationship with God. You know, and if you think about it, if you're working on that first, there's going to be an overflow of the Holy Spirit. If you're working on God first, you're going to have a better relationship with your wife, your girlfriend, your best friend, your boss at work, whatever. It's going to be like an overflow. And it's like the Lord's like, if you, you know, if you prioritize me, I have your back and all the other stuff. Like, like. Jesus knows we need a place to live and we need money and this and that, you know, and sometimes we just get caught up in this rat race of the world and we put our faith in this world or in our job and our bank account and our husband, our wife, whatever. And again, I'm not saying to neglect those things. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying it's a condition of your heart. What is number one? You know, um, I look at it like this. Number one is God. Number two is your friends and family. Number three is like your vocation or whatever you're doing in life, like your job, or if you're a full-time student or whatever, you know what I mean? Though it's God, the people in your life, and then whatever it is that makes money or whatever, you know, your hobbies, all that, that's like third really on the list of pri priorities. Um, so I think, that's good. But so, so, and the other thing is like, so John comes and he's starting to get things riled up. Like in a way you can look at it as John is like the uh, original hype man, you know, um, he's got a mission to come prepare the way for Jesus. And like, sometimes I wonder, is that just because like Jesus is going to be so shocking to the system? Well, Jesus ends up being very shocking to the system. They kill him, you know? because they're so upset with what he's claiming and what he's doing. Um, it's almost like, I'm like, Lord, did like, you need to send like someone ahead of you to kind of soften the blow of how radical and different you were going to be. And keep in mind, John is pretty radical, right? John was known for just having a ministry and like living off of the land and eating, I think locusts and wearing like, animal skin clothes and living in the wilderness. And he was probably considered a weirdo to most people, you know, back then, not recognizing who he is um, and not recognizing who Jesus is, you know, and I think this modern world doesn't either, you know, Jonathan, bald man Riz, Hey brother, I'm going to be lurking my friend, my friend, much love, much love. I hope you listened. I hope you got a little sum out of this encouragement, whatever, but thank you guys so much for being here. It means the world to me. And uh, like the Bible says, you know, where two or more, where two or more gathered in his name, there he is also. And so uh, it, that's, it's self-explanatory. When believers come together, Jesus is that we can have faith. Jesus is here with us. You know, he's, he's speaking to us through his word. All right. So I'm going to jump and, and we won't go much longer. Archmagus, God bless. Um, I'm going to go till seven ish. <clears throat> so we're almost done here, but, um, what do we have? What do we got here? Verse 20, um, verse 29, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me for he was before me. I did not know him, but he 
but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he sent me to baptize with water. Uh, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Okay, so this is... This is cool, you know, and what an honor to be John, but John baptizes Jesus with water, you know, and John admits in the scriptures, like, I'm not even worthy to untie his sandals. Like, why am I the one who gets to baptize the savior of the world? But it's like, John is like one of the first witnesses in a way of who this man is, because when he baptizes him, like it says in verse 32, and John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So John had a relationship with God, the Father. And he was seeking God before Jesus comes on the scene. And this was prophesied like from God to John, you know, and he's like, this is who I was talking about. And so when he baptizes Jesus, a miracle happened, you know, and I, I would love to see this sight, but it says like this, I saw the spirit of God d descending upon him like a dove. And that's why you see the imagery of a dove oftentimes in churches and stuff. Um, there's that. And then there's also, I think the dove from Noah and the ark who comes to like show Noah that the land has vegetation growing on it. But the dove has like a lot of meaning, you know, in, in the Bible. And so it's John like having confirmation of like this man's special, you know, this is different. The spirit of God is upon this man like mightily always. And uh, it happened when he baptized him, you know. So again, I do think public physical baptism is important. Like we should do it, you know, if you haven't done it, go to a church, get connected with the church. You know, people churches love to baptize. It's not hard to find a church that'll baptize you on a Sunday. They're like, awesome. Yeah, let's do it. You know, get your swim trunks, whatever. And John says, and I have seen and testified that this is the son of God. Um, the first disciples again, the next day, John stood with two of his disciples and looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, behold the lamb of God. So again, guys, the, the lamb of God thing, Remember, in the Old Testament, in order to absolve their sins, part of the, the Jewish ceremonial law was they had to sacrifice so X amount of animals. And the th whole thought process behind this is when a man sins, he's guilty. He technically deserves punishment or death because of his sin these animals stand in as an innocent sacrifice. So it's like, God's like, well, if you're not going to spill your blood for your sin, you're going to have to spill the blood of an innocent animal and that'll atone for your sins. And I still don't fully grasp this or understand this, but I talked about it last week in the Bible study, but there's something, there's something sacred in blood. Um, Obviously, like I said last week, we have to have blood to live. If you lose too much blood, you die. So physically, obviously, blood's important. But I also believe there's something spiritual that's going on with blood um, that maybe I don't understand yet, or maybe none of us will ever fully understand. But it's like, again, if your blood is owed to God because your sin, he, he's like, okay, if you're not going to pay, well, then an innocent animal can pay with his blood life has to be taken essentially and it's harsh and it's freaky and i know um, but it's almost like the natural spiritual order of things and how they go so john's like well this is why christians and, and and the jews back then who believed in jesus were so happy they're like this is the lamb of god lamb uh god finally brought his own sacrifice his perfect sacrifice that will end them having to actually kill animals to atone for their sins. No one has to kill an animal to atone for their sins anymore. Oh, back to the blood thing, though. One thing I feel like God showed me recently, 
because I used to like think, God, that's so harsh and mean. And why do poor animals have to like die for someone's sin? They're innocent, whatever. The Lord gently spoke to me and gave me this realization and is like, how many times have you eaten meat? <laughs> so like most people probably for most of the time in the world have eaten meat. An innocent animal had to die in order to physically sustain you and give you life, you know? So I'm like, well, we all do it to some degree. Okay. Not non-Christians don't believe in all this stuff, right? I get that. But all of us who have ever eaten meat in order to survive has lived off the life of another animal. And then when I thought of that, I thought that was really, really freaky. Okay. One more thing about blood that makes me believe in God in the Bible, but like I've been doing some like um, not, not research. I, well, a little bit, like I've been watching testimonies of people who were like former Satanists and former witches and they become Christians, dude, blood in their, in their religion or in their Satanism is super important to them. And they do rituals and spells with blood, you know, and, uh, I just find that fascinating weird bizarre but it almost just confirms what like i already believe about the bible and god and faith i find it very bizarre that here's the satanist who hate god anti-god whatever and they they realize something spiritual is powerful about blood like this former ex-witch was ta talking about how she would like cut herself and then bleed into these like ritual bowls and keep them on, on an altar where she had all these objects like it used in magic and witchcraft. And like some of her rituals were, would require her to cut herself and bleed into the bowl. And then she said, and leave the blood in the bowl. Like I wouldn't wash the bowl out or anything because there's like potent magic in that. Now it's finally going to connect to Warcraft, Archmagus. I don't know if you're still listening and all like fantasy lore. But in most fantasy lore, evil, dark magic is blood magic, right? And the blood elves are like the bad elves because they were the elves that started to like dabble with like rituals with blood. Dude, you guys, the Bible's got nothing on the Lord of the Rings. You know what I mean? Like this is all real, guys. This is all spiritual stuff. There are people in the world who follow the devil. They they serve the devil. They do do Satan things. And I, I'm not a Satanist. I've never been close to a Satanist. I've never had any interest in being a Satanist or anything like that, right? So I don't know what it's like. But when you hear these testimonies of ex-witches and Satanists, um, it blows your mind to think like there is a people in the world that draw a pentagram on the ground and light candles and bleed into bowls and pray to Satan, you know, and like that corny quote cliche as it is the greatest trick the devil ever played on the world is convincing the world that he doesn't exist, you know, because a lot of us think, Oh, none of that's true. None of that's real, you know, whatever. Um, okay. I think we got far enough. It's almost been an hour. So I'm going to close in prayer. Shout out to bald man Riz and Archmagus for, uh, coming by and, uh, and listening. Um, and I, I, all I can pray is that I hope it helps you. I hope it encourages you. I hope it comforts you. I hope you learn something. I hope it makes you more curious to seek God for yourself. Um, but yeah, let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. Um, on Twitch, doing a Bible study, Lord, and it, it truly is all for you, Father. It, it's to be used for your glory in, 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 in any way you see fit, Father God. I pray for anybody who sees this, any viewer who sees this, um, I pray that you open their eyes to who you are and your truth and that they would seek you. At the end of the day, all of us men and women have to seek you for ourselves. There's nothing wrong with going to church. There's nothing wrong with going to Bible study. There's nothing wrong with volunteering. There's nothing wrong with all the things that you call us to do. But at the end of the day, Father, we all have to seek you for our own selves. We could go to a Bible study every night of the week and not know you. 
we could go to church every day of the week and still not know you because at the end of the day we have to shut the door to our room get on our knees pray to you seek you talk to you and read your word and start to to let you minister to us and show show us individually what you want us to do father so i pray for people for encouragement to do that because it, it can be scary our sin gets in the way we don't want to deal with it we want to put it on the back burner for later but the bible says the day of salvation is now and every day that we wake up and have a new day it's a new day to seek you to follow you to let you minister to us show us teach us comfort us and guide us um so i pray for that for people god that they would seek you and that you would reveal yourself to them father i love you lord and again thank you for this time in jesus name i pray amen